this is Salisa Elwein. Welcome back to 50,000 Degrees and Cloudy, A Better Resurrection. We are continuing our study in Section 1. We're going to skip a few chapters. I mean, we still want you to buy the book to, to find the good stuff. But I wanted to clarify a little bit more about the title itself, 50,000 Degrees and Cloudy. We've touched on some of the things in the book about the clouds and how Israel was gathered into the clouds as a prophecy of the resurrection. But if you'll remember, we read something out of one of the Targums explaining the words where Aaron is being instructed how to go up and to light the menorah. And the translator used the word lightning to light the menorah. You thought, well, that's a strange turn of phrase. Where could he possibly getting this idea that it takes lightning to light a menorah? So that takes us back to the 50,000 degrees. Lightning can heat up to 50,000 degrees. Let's go back as we finish up uh, section one and before we go on to section two, which is what happens after we die. And let's look at this lightning that the Targumist might be talking about. Number one, we, off, we know that often when the cloud would appear, uh, let's just take Mount Sinai for an example. Uh, we, we, we won't even deal with the Mount of Transfiguration where there was this bright light and so forth. Let's just look at the cloud that enveloped the mountain at Mount Sinai at the giving of the Torah. And remember on our axis, this is Shavuot, which celebrates the giving of the Torah. It's the axis of everything. Everything's in the Torah. And so the voice of Adonai was accompanied by both thunder and lightning. So when we think of the spoken word or we think of the voice of Adonai, we can think of it as thunder and lightning. And we have a verse uh, in Deuteronomy 33 that refers back to this event at, um, at the mountain of the giving of the Torah. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 2 through 3. And Moses said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. Indeed, he loves his people. All your holy ones are in your hand, and they followed in your steps. Everyone receives of your words. So in his right hand was flashing lightning. What does he give to Moshe? He gives him sapphire tablets of the commandments. So the voice and the word of Adonai is flashing lightning. That's the description of it. And then it clarifies, it says, everyone receives of your words. So we know we're on the right track. When we look at the voice of Adonai as uh, being accompanied by or represented by flashing lightning. And again, if we look at Yeshua as the right hand, as being that symbol of the living word, as being that lightning at the right hand. What does Yeshua come to do? He comes to show people that he is the word. He is the word made flesh. So he's Adonai's holy word given to a holy people in the person of Yeshua. He's going to come like lightning, flashing lightning, because that's the precedent and that's the prophecy. So if you receive the word, then you will repent and then um, you're going to be gathered into the body of Messiah at Yom HaKippurim. You're going to be gathered into a cloud. You will be actually in Yeshua's hand in the protection of that cloud. And remember, one of the patterns of the wilderness is you feed on manna. You feed on heavenly food, the food of angels. Um, and that's what it says in the, the New King James. It says, from his right hand came a fiery law for them. So we're feeding on his word again. Um, and it's a, it's a flashing lightning. And I don't know if you remember this, but when you were a kid, did you ever play the game where somebody would have an M&M &M 
in his hand, and if you could grab the M&M before they close their hand, you could have the M&M. Well, just imagine yourself as an M&M in Yeshua's hand. And if Yeshua is fast as lightning, no one is ever going to be able to snatch you out of his hand. You will be perfectly protected in this day of trouble. Yeshua says uh, in uh, John 10, 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Remember the lightning? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. That makes perfect sense. The flashing lightning in his right hand, it represents Yeshua, it represents the Word, it represents the Torah. Nobody can snatch you out of the Word. That's the Father's protection to you. The Holy Ones have nothing to fear. They're going to be gathered into his hand in the cloud. There's no enemy dead or alive that's fast enough to harm you when you're in the hand of Yeshua. So Yeshua's appearance. Uh, we didn't cover some of the chapters in section one, and one of those are the clothes, the garments of light associated with the garden. But we know that Yeshua's glorified appearance was very bright. And he could also take on many forms, by the way. Uh, sometimes people didn't recognize him, but we see, you know, transformation in, in such a way that we can imagine as far as our transformed bodies, what they might be like. If we go back to the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 10, verses five through six, he says, I lifted my eyes and looked and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like, like flaming torches. There's our flaming torches again. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult, uh, a roar. So the words of Yeshua are like the sounds of a roar, a tumult, a, a great um, crowd of people. Uh, it can also be like the sound of water, like rushing water that's so loud it just drowns out everything else. We can trace this back to the creation. If uh, we look at Jeremiah 51, 15, it says, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding, he stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he causes the clouds to ascend from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Wow, look how many words in the hood ended up in that passage. Look how many concepts are popping up together. When he utters his voice, it's going to be this, this great sound in the heavens. And what does that happen when you hear his voice? It causes the clouds, and remember where did Israel live? They lived in the clouds. They were gathered into the clouds. It says to ascend, to go up from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. That's, that's so cool because we know his voice is like lightning. And uh, one of the traditions, and it's actually based on scripture, is that resurrection is the dew of heaven. It's this moisture from heaven. And it says he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Think of the spirit moving over the dead to resurrect them. So the voice of Adonai 
and therefore the voice of Yeshua, we often see that equated with the sound of thunder, um, with lightning. And then Jeremiah is adding a, a concept here. It also sounds like a lot of water as well. Why? Because water causes the clouds to form. And so Yeshua is that voice of Adonai, and his voice is as the voice of many waters, creating that moisture that again is going to form the clouds for the righteous to be gathered into from the ends of the earth. Job describes it in chapter 37. He says, At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Listen closely to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that goes out from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it loose and is lightning to the ends of the earth. We know what that lightning's going to do. It's going to go gather his holy ones in his hand. After it, a voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders with his voice wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend. And that is the truth. We cannot even begin to comprehend what the resurrection will be like. Um, but we should know if we hear the shofar, if we hear the thunder, if we see the lightning accompanying the voice of Adonai, we're there. It's time. A single lightning flash, just talking about the natural realm, it's formed by a series of lightning strokes. And usually, scientists tell us there's about four strokes per flash. So if we look in Hebrew at the number four, it's the, the delet, which also means a door, dalet. Four, authority, just like on our menorah. The four, no matter which side you start from, is the axis of the chiasm because it represents authority on earth. And so with these four strokes, what is the lightning saying? It's reminding us of the door. It's reminding us of the authority, the, the voice of Adonai coming from heaven to the earth. It's connecting the earth to the heavens. And that's what Yeshua said. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. What is he saying? How do you get into the garden? Remember, a Hebrew is one who crosses over. How do you cross over? Through the door, Yeshua. He is the one who can bring you back in to those rivers of Eden, to that place of many waters, the rivers. And physical lightning, again, it's going to connect heaven to earth at a, a trajectory that's so fast it can heat to 50,000 degrees. Now that's pretty hot. That's a little too hot. But what we do know about lightning is in terms of destruction, it can be attracted to tall or proud objects on earth. In Hebrew, it's kind of one and the same. If it's tall, it can also mean proud depending on context. So if you want to avoid the destructive power of lightning, something to avoid is pride and the high places. In fact, experts say if you think a lightning strike is coming, just prostrate yourself on the ground and maybe it'll miss you. It'll, it'll find some other high object to go to. Well, that's a great object lesson. If we feel the judgment coming, it never hurts to fall on your face and repent. I would say if you start feeling the hair on the back of your neck stand up, fall faster. Get down there and pray and repent and humble yourself so that that destructive power of the lightning can be replaced with that voice of Adonai that would gather you. Same thing, the voice of Yeshua. When you hear that voice, humble yourself. And he says in due time, he will lift you up. There's also um, a phenomenon called a red 
sprite, when we're looking at these phenomena of a, a storm. But it makes you think of the, the breastplate of the high priest. In the Torah portion, Pekudeh, which remember I, I challenged you, go back and read these three Torah portions. Baha Alecha, uh, Pekudeh, and Kitisa. Because you'll get so much information about the resurrection. And again, you can go back, you can purchase the book. It'll go in much more detail with you. But these precious stones that were found in Aaron's breastplate of judgment, remember but it was about judgment. Uh, Jewish tradition tells us that they were carried into the wilderness by a cloud along with the manna. Now, sometimes they don't want you to take these things literally. They're teaching lessons. But in terms of teaching, that's a great lesson to think that if the, the manna was carried to us in the cloud of Yeshua, that those precious stones were also carried in the cloud with Yeshua. And that's what he said, I'm the bread of heaven. He identified himself with those supplies. And these red sprites that'll pop up in a thunderstorm have a connection to those stones of the breastplate. A sprite, remember, that means a spirit, right? Now that's, uh, <laughs> there's also sprites in Shakespeare, but basically these are little spirits, all right? But the red sprites, as a, a phenomenon, they're these massive luminous flashes in a thunderstorm that will appear directly above an active thunderstorm. And they will occur at exactly the same time as the cloud to the ground or intracloud lightning strokes. So at the same time you've got your 50,000 degree lightning, these red sprites, these, these red spirits would appear above the cloud. And the structure of this sprite, for lack of a better word, other than what they're calling it, they can be small single or multiple vertically elongated spots. All right, if you can picture that in your mind's eye. And I'm gonna give you something you can go pull up. You can go pull up an image of it and it'll give you a, an idea. But these sprites that appear above the thundercloud that occur at the same time as the lightning, they're most often red, and they'll occur in pairs of two or more. So what do these red sprites have in common with the throne of heaven or with the breastplate of judgment? Here's what John saw in Revelation 4, 2 through 3. He says, at once I was in the spirit Okay, and I think this is just wonderful how physical things can represent spiritual things down to even naming them a red sprite. He says, at once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Okay, so those are two things you can go look up on the internet if you want to see a picture of them. Jasper and Carnelian. Jasper in Hebrew is Yashveh, and it means glittering. And that's going to be the last gem in the high priest's breastplate. And it's actually the first of New Jerusalem's foundations. It's usually a shade of red in color, and it can be very highly polished and actually used for seals which makes you think of the seals of Revelation. When the colors are in stripes and bands, and remember, that's how the red sprite appears. It gets these vertical bands of red. It says when the colors are in stripes or bands, they are called striped or banded jasper. Interesting that it's the same. The second stone that he describes, which is the carnelian, is a red or a reddish brown stone. And it's derived from a Latin word meaning flesh in reference because sometimes it's a reddish flesh color. If the red sprites occur in pairs, 
It may be reflecting a symbol or a reminder, just like there's reminders in the stars, reflecting the appearance of the one on the throne because his appearance is both in the brightness of the spirit, but then in Yeshua in the flesh. So even in nature, we're getting these messages, these testimonies of Yeshua. There's another one called blue jets that can occur above a thunderstorm. And uh, these are described as narrow cones that they're just kind of ejected um, from that electrically charged core region of a thunderstorm. And according to the dictionary, it says this jet, it may be a narrow stream of material emanating or appearing to emanate from a celestial object. So what could that be like if we're comparing this to the throne? Let's go back to Sinai again, where it was 50,000 degrees and cloudy because the cloud descended upon the mountain along with the thunder and the lightning. Here's something else that happened on that mountain. It says, Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. So you've got these thunderstorm colors that correspond to the red, the jasper, and the carnelian, which would correspond to the one that John sees sitting on the throne. But the blue jets are the color of the sapphire pavement that are under his feet. So where he would sit on the throne and where his feet would be, now what God's feet look like, who knows? Uh, obviously, they're not like human feet, uh, but the best we can come in terms of understanding is to look at human feet and say, well, that has something to do with, with the way that Adonai's feet are. But what we do know is that there is, there is a sapphire pavement or brickwork under his feet. And again, after the Jasper, if we go to the New Jerusalem, the second foundation stone of New Jerusalem is sapphire. Um, so what is happening here? The earth itself, the, the thunderstorms, the things that appeared at the giving of the Torah, even in the natural realm, they're testifying to the things that we know about the heavenlies. And that's our job as the holy ones. Remember it says myriads of holy, holy ones came with him at the giving of the Torah. That's our job to declare His glory, to praise Him, like Psalm 47 says, to obey the angel of the presence um, in this temple of our bodies on earth while we await the resurrection. Um, and as we're gathered into this new Jerusalem, even if it is 50,000 degrees and cloudy in new Jerusalem, Remember, that's home. What would be destruction for the wicked will be a place of comfort, according to Paul, to the righteous. So, to sum up, as you go through the Torah portions, the more you learn about the movement of the cloud, whether it's the glory of the cloud descending upon the tabernacle, where that presence is so strong that people can hardly stand. Um, that's part of that gathering. Why? Because a tabernacle was built to create a central place of worship, to gather his people. It's also called the Ohel Moed, which is the tent of meeting. It's a place where he wants to meet with us. It's the place where the cloud is. It's the place where the flashing lightning is. It's the place where the thunder is. All these things accompanied the giving of the Torah. And so when we think of what it means to be resurrected from the dead, then we just go back to the Torah, we study the wilderness journey, 
And then many of the things in the prophets and the Psalms will begin to fall into place because now we have the words in the hood. We understand the movements of, of the cloud, that when the cloud moved, the people moved. When the cloud settled down, the people settled down. The cloud created a dwelling place so that Adonai could dwell among them. The cloud of incense and the Holy of Holies is where the cloud of Adonai could merge with that cloud created by the incense, the prayers of the people. And they could, again, they're clouds, but they're a cloud. So we see again that unity. But for a lot of people at the mountain, they saw the clouds, they saw the thunder, they saw the lightning, they heard these things, and they were frightened. They heard the Ten Commandments, and then they told Moses, if we hear any more of this, we're going to die. You go up, Moses. And so Moses had to go up, get the entirety of the Torah, and bring it back and convey it to the people, because they really did feel like they would die. Remember Lot, when he's escaping from Sodom, He's told to go into the mountains, which basically represents the mountains around Jerusalem. He's being told, go back to Abraham, go back to righteousness. And he says, I'll die. Please just let me go to this little small wicked city. It's just a small one. Isn't it small? He had difficulty seeing the word of life, the commandments of life as life. He thought that something else was life and that life was going to kill him. And it will. There are parts of us that need to die and be purged and burned off before we hear that shofar. Before we're called up at the resurrection, we don't want those things attached to us. We would rather have attached ourselves to heavenly things on this earth, to the, the silver and the gold and the bronze things of the world that the Father gives us to invest in those things so that we won't suffer that loss where we're trying to drag things into the garden that just won't make the trip across the river. Remember, the definition of a river is something that's burning and shining. And if we have those things attached to us, Yeshua comes to restore us to the garden, not to restore us with all our junk. And so he gives us those opportunities of repentance so that we can very easily cross this river and feel right at home. In other words, we've already, what did David say? Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Well, how can we live in his courts right now? We're not in the garden yet. Well, he gave you his word so you could live as though you were already living in the garden. And when that time comes that you're called to cross over into the garden, it will be no different then than it is today because you're already dwelling in his presence and living in his word and you see life in his word and you're not playing around with the things of the world and saying, can't I just do a little bit of wickedness? It's just a little, it's not much, just, just this much. Please, angel, let me just have a little bit of fun in this wicked city. Don't make me go to the mountains. I can't live there. The Israelites have said, don't give us any more commandments, we'll die. But see in Yeshua, with that joy of the Holy Spirit, you can engage those commandments out of love. And you won't see them as death. You'll see them in life. You'll have a completely different relationship to them. And you will be able to go up on the mountain with Moses. You will be able to eat and to drink on that sapphire pavement and you will be able to dwell with him forever. And that's what Paul wrote. So shall we be with him forever. That's why we're engaging the feasts. So that the spirit that moves particularly in those feasts can bring us to the proper places of repentance, of salvation, of redemption, of righteousness, so that we can prepare ourselves it's just a short journey, guys. It's right in the tops of the balsam trees. It's no higher than a dove can fly.
that's not the kingdom is right here. It's right upon us. And we can start living right now, today, as though we are in the garden with his work.